Hello, everyone. I'm coming in to you today with a very important topic. And I'm sorry to say that after 50 years of research with thrombosis prophylaxis, that we even have to discuss these issues the way I'm going to present them today. So on with the show. The Grim Reaper. Now, is it COVID-19? It's possible Grim Reaper, but that's not what I'm talking about today. Fatal pulmonary embolism are the number one preventable cause of death after surgery. And that's what I'm referring to. In the United States, vital records indicate that uh, 9.4 per 100,000 uh, patients will develop this problem. And a combination of surveillance data and modeling methods uh, from the CDC estimate the rate to be 19.4 to 32.3 per 100,000. In the US surveillance data, uh, 60 to 100,000 people die of of PE each year is important, but using modeling methods, the number may be as high as 300,000. And in Europe, uh, modeling methods have indicated that it could be up to 370,000. It is astonishing that PE mortality has increased over the past decade. Now here's a typical patient who presents to the ER with a non-productive cough, wheezing, dyspnea, and moderate back pain for five days. The patient developed a massive PE and died three days after admission to the intensive care unit. Prophylaxis was not given. Now, why would that be? Well, one of the reasons is that this may have been a very a seriously ill patient and they, the doctors were occupied with other concerns. But this is the number one preventable cause of death. And I'd like to present to you the thrombosis giants that shaped the world of surgical prophylaxis for the past 50 years. Professor V.B. Kekar and his son, the Right Honorable Professor Lord A.J. Kekar. Now, Professor Kekar Sr., B.J., in 1975, presented an international trial of 4,121 patients having major surgery. The primary endpoint was fatal PE. The patients were randomized to receive either unfractionated heparin two hours before surgery and every eight hours post-operatively for seven days, and 180 patients died during the hospital period, 100 in the control group and 80 in the unfractionated heparin group. What was shown was the incidence of fatal pulmonary embolism was highly statistically significantly reduced in the patients receiving the unfractionated heparin. Now, many people didn't believe in that trial early on, and most people were nervous to use anticoagulants in the surgical patients. But 15 years later, along comes Rory Collins, an Oxford scholar, and he presents the results of 70 additional trials in over 13,000 patients uh, from around the world, showing the exact same thing. The incidence of fatal pulmonary emboli were reduced by a relative risk of 66% in the patients receiving unfractionated heparin compared to the controls, and there was no difference in bleeding. As a matter of fact, ladies and gentlemen, remember that bleeding from a, a prophylactic dose of anticoagulation is a medical curiosity. Now let's turn to his son, A.J. Kekar, who in 2005 uh, did a brilliant study with a very, very uh, famous and brilliant investigator from um, Munich, Germany. Sylvia Haas, and they uh, presented a series of 23,000 surgical patients. And at the time, the oh, there was a company sponsoring this that thought that, that maybe they could show that their new product, low molecular weight heparin, might be better than unfractionated heparin for the prevention of venous thrombosis in surgical patients. The endpoint was autopsy adjudicated pulmonary embolism. And look at this, a tenth of a percent incidence of fatal pulmonary emboli. This is how you prevent fatal pulmonary emboli. It's very clear. And in this trial, the risk of, of, of death, of course, was so low. There were no deaths from anticoagulant bleeding. Sure, there were some bleeding events, but nobody died. And the period of prophylaxis was a week. So now we have from 1975 to 2005, 43,000 patients in 160 centers with objective endpoints, anticoagulant prophylaxis for a one week established efficacy. 
Then along comes in the CHESS guidelines in 2012, a further meta-analysis of 51 randomized controlled trials comparing low molecular weight heparin with low dose unfractionated heparin in 48,000 general and abdominal surgical patients. They concluded that most studies, the follow-up was seven days or even up to a month, and the risk of, was 30% lower in the low molecular weight heparin group of all venous thromboembolism. Now, what's disappointing is that there was no notation or no even footnote in this, in this uh, guidelines that everybody follows that the, uh, they didn't provide emphasis that one week of prophylaxis was used in all of these trials and it was shown to be efficacious. And why in the world was, were they still uh, advocating, and even up to today, many patients, not to use prophylaxis once the patient leaves the hospital? Well, at that time, the Boston data wasn't there, but the Boston data is the poster child for venous thrombosis prophylaxis in the United States. And they, they, this is a success story based on a mandatory use of the Caprini scoring system, providing prophylaxis to patients according to an algorithm that was mandatory. Of course, the doctors could always opt out. And this was a standardized in the electronic medical record it also involved early post-operative mobilization, mandatory VTE risk stratification with the Caprini score. The type and duration of prophylaxis was dictated by the results of the score, and VTE outcomes were compared before and after implementing the protocol. And the VTE incidence in this, in this study decreased 84% from 1.9% to 3 tenths of a percent. And the pulmonary embolism incidence, get this, fell by 55% from 1.1% to less than a half a percent at 30 days. And the VTE outcomes declined from an odds ratio of 3.4 to 0.94. And here is an algorithm that shows the various groups. And as you can see in low, moderate, and high, uh, 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 up to three to four the low and moderate patients, 100% uh, implementation was done. And in those days, they had to use low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin because of the Surgical Care Improvement Project. And this was a project that mandated that all patients get a dose of, of anticoagulation within 24 hours of surgery unless they were at high risk of bleeding. Now, since that time, we've, it's been figured out that that technique doesn't work. And a large 30,000 patient study proved that in 2012. So that mandate was removed. So if you went to Boston today, they wouldn't advocate giving anticoagulation for any, any patients less than, than five. Now, if the patients had a score of five to eight, they got low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin for seven days. It didn't make any difference where they were, if whether they went home or they didn't go home. And if they had a score of nine and above, they got heparin or low molecular weight heparin for 30 days. And as you can see, 77% compliance with that tactic. And here's the results. And you can see them pictorially and they getting down to a very low incidence of fatal pulmonary embolism in 30 days. So why, don't it, why doesn't every hospital do this, you ask? Well, this is probably some uh, fancy uh, hospital in a high rent district in, in Boston. So these people can afford all the anticoagulation. No, no, no. This is an indigent hospital. And the administrators of the hospital made an arrangement with the drug company manufacturers to provide the drug to everyone who needed it, despite their ability to pay. And that's why this is a poster child. And if every hospital in the US did this, it'd be very few pulmonary emboli. We also know that pulmonary emboli, and this is a series of 2 million patients, uh, goes on for the first 30 days and the incidence is still there. We also know that of patients that were found later to have a blood clot in this beautiful Riete database, 77% of them got their blood clot after they left the hospital and half of them after anticoagulation was stopped. There's a brand new study out now I don't have time to go into, shows exactly the same thing. That was 2008 and that course now is 2021. And you have to know that high Caprini scores received extended prophylaxis, and we don't have time to discuss it today, but COVID-19 magnifies all of these problems. Now let's talk about the Caprini score. There are many scores around the world, and like there are many roads to Rome, and, and, and certainly you can use your favorite score. And if your hospital is already using a score, that's fine. 
But the reason we chose the Caprini score is because it's the most comprehensive history and physical of 40 elements, been validated in 5 million patients in 200 studies around the world. And what it, we know is as the number of risk factors goes up, the incidence of blood clot goes up. We also know as the power of each risk factor increases, that also increases the risk of thrombosis. And for example, uh, a bed rest is a low risk uh, factor, but cancer of the pancreas is a high risk. So putting together the weight and the number of factors, we came up with a score, as I say, been validated around the world. And the score represents a nonlinear increase in clinical VTE rate with increasing score. As the number goes up, two, three, four, five, six, so does the incidence of venous thrombosis. And here are the results in general surgery. And you see the set point isn't five. Here, really, the, the high set point is over eight or nine and above. Boston showed that same thing. And of course, the other thing I'd like to point out is that we have this in a separate video, that there are certain patients, for example, in head and neck surgery, that if they have a score of five, almost nobody gets a clot. So the set point varies with the individual population. Now, it's very difficult to collect all of these factors, so we advocate using a patient-friendly form that's in a variety of languages. It's a very straightforward form, but there's two really critical elements, and this is the only score in the world that I know of that covers these critical elements. The first is for women and obstetrical misadventures, including stillborns, three or more spontaneous abortions, uh, a, a growth-restricted infant to with toxemia, and these defects may reflect the patient carrying the antiphosphate antibody syndrome. And that is a very powerful predictor of venous thrombosis. There's three elements to that antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. There's lupus anticoagulant, there's beta-2 glycoprotein, and there's anticardiolipin antibodies. If depending on whether or not they have one, two, or three of those, that patient is at high risk of thrombosis. And they may carry those lifelong. So you've got to include that in your history. Now, in addition to that, the other thing that's really important is family history of thrombosis. It's often not even collected. And in the National Surgical Quality Improvement Project, it's not collected. In the Padua score, the improved score, it's not collected. Only talk about thrombophilia. They don't talk about family history of thrombosis. Hats off to the, uh, the National Health Service uh, risk assessment in England, where it is part of the uh, risk assessment. So now how does a surgeon prevent these fatal embolic events? First of all, a thorough assessment of the patient's risk factors is necessary. Appropriate use of anticoagulant prophylaxis for the entire period of thrombotic, thrombotic risk is, is, is absolutely mandatory. High risk patients require seven to 10 days of anticoagulant prophylaxis. Very high patients may benefit from 14 to 28 days of anticoagulant prophylaxis. Take a look at the Boston protocol. If every hospital followed this protocol, the fatal PEE rate would be very, very low. Some patients remain at risk for longer periods and require continued anticoagulant prophylaxis. Patients who are immobilized and non-weight bearing and wear, wear casts or braces that limit ankle or knee function, especially those in full extension of the knee, are at risk. If you don't put weight on the leg, the blood flow doesn't increase over baseline. If you don't pump your ankle, the blood flow doesn't get pumped out of the leg. And if your leg is in full extension, it may squeeze the popliteal vein due to the gastroc muscle, and that may slow down blood flow out of the leg. Very powerful pathophysiologic forces. These individuals are thrombosis prone, especially if they have also additional risk factors, obesity, medical comorbidities, or family history of thrombosis. Clinical judgment and experience can dictate using anticoagulant prophylaxis in the absence of a clinical trial. These patients need protection. And if you, any of you have not protected them and they've died, then maybe the next time that happens, you'll wanna protect them. Remember, a randomized trial was not necessary to establish the value of using a parachute when jumping out of an airplane. One may argue that clinical experience and judgment may be used to prevent fatal pulmonary emboli in high-risk individuals without the existence of a specific trial involving a number of similar patients. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, fatal pulmonary emboli are 99% preventable postoperatively. Using heparin or low molecular weight heparin for patients with appropriate levels of risk or a minimum of seven to 10 days, for a minimum of seven to 10 days is important. 
Very high risk patients may benefit from extended prophylaxis. Protecting patients during their entire period of risk is fundamental. This is, this is not rocket science. If a patient can't walk and is totally immobilized for three months, they need three months of prophylaxis. Encourage patient-friendly risk assessment completion with family members. You should all huddle together and find out if Aunt Tilly really had a, a blood clot and, and make sure that you record that and then take it to your personal physician and make sure the personal physician validates what you have come up with with you and the family. Never forget to include family history of thrombosis and obstetrical complications in your analysis. Validated score can then be placed in the permanent medical record and the baseline value is available at the time of injury, hospitalization, or surgery. And I can tell you now that there are uh, various programs in including uh, uh, artificial intelligence uh, in order to capture the data and produce algorithms and using machine learning to predict who's going to get a clot and how to prevent it. And finally, never kill a friend, never treat a stranger. Now, what's that all about? Well, my dear friend in Maine, we walked together and he was an academic dentist and he always started quizzing me about the, the Caprini scoring. And he said, well, Joe, you know, after listening to you, it's very simple. And that is that you need to perform a thorough history and physical, and that'll give you knowledge about your patients as if they were a good friend. So of course, Joe, you would never kill a good friend, but you would also never treat a stranger. This is particularly critical now during this COVID-19 pandemic. So ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. Please visit my social media platforms that are all listed below. And everyone, please stay safe and have a wonderful day. Thank you very much. Thank you.